the rise of the House of Rothschild. Count Egon Caesar Court. Translated from German by Brian and Beatrix Lunn. 1770-1830. Forward. Historians, in interpreting the 19th century, have laid stress on many and various aspects of the period under study. And descriptions of isolated periods, single episodes, and individuals are scattered amongst hundreds and even thousands of books. On the other hand, certain special features of the period under consideration have been, for various reasons, entirely neglected. An example of such neglect is the ignoring by historians of the role played by the Rothschild family in the history of the 19th century, and the object of this work is to appraise the important influence of this family on the politics of the period, not only in Europe but throughout the world. For, strangely enough, the influence of the Rothschilds is barely mentioned, or at the most casually referred to, in otherwise comprehensive and painstaking historical treatises. Special literature dealing with the House of Rothschild usually falls into one of two groups either fulsome peons of praise commissioned by the House itself, or scurrilous pamphlets inspired by hatred, both equally unpleasant. There are, however, two works of serious value in existence, which are partially compiled from legal documents, but they are of small scope. One is by an employee of the Rothschilds, Christian Wilhelm Bergerifer and the other is the impartial work of Dr. Richard Ehrenberg. But these treat only of isolated incidents in the history of the house, and throw no light on its pan-European importance. The object of the present work, which deals with the period 1770-1830, is to trace the rise of the House of Rothschild from its small beginnings to the great position it attained, culminating in the year of its great crisis. In the course of my researches I found that references to the name of Rothschild in official documents and in books of memoirs were as common as they are rare in contemporary textbooks. I made a point of collecting all available data until my drawers were literally crammed with letters, deeds, and documents containing the name of Rothschild, and bearing dates of almost every year of the 19th century. My next step was to visit the various European capitals which have been the scene of the family activities, in order to enrich my store of references with all the relevant literature. The subject is indeed inexhaustible, but the material I had amassed encouraged me to essay a complete picture. The subject required the most delicate treatment, but my determination to undertake the work was accompanied by the definite intention of according it complete impartiality, for I was convinced from the beginning that a prejudiced outlook would render the work utterly valueless. The House of Rothschild, as will be readily understood, did not throw open its archives to my inspection, for it is particularly careful in guarding its more important business secrets. But this was not entirely without its advantage, for it left me completely free from political considerations and uninfluenced by racial, national, and religious predilections or antipathies. I was thus enabled, in accordance with my wish, to begin an independent historical research into the part played by this house in the 19th century which I knew to be far more important than is commonly thought. The general scheme of this work will be built upon facts alone, in a practical way such as will help us to form our own judgment on individuals and the part they played in world events. I should like to take this opportunity of expressing my special sense of gratitude toward all those whose advice and assistance have been so valuable to me in my work. Above all I have to thank Dr. Bittner, Director of the State Archives at Vienna, as well as his exceedingly helpful staff, Professors Gross, Antonius, Rianoe, Schmidt, Walken, and his chief clerk, Herr Merck. I should also like to thank Lieutenant Colonel von Karlshausen, grand-nephew of the man who helped the Rothschilds up the first rung of the ladder, and the director of the Prussian Secret State Archives at Berlin, J. Imrat Klinkenborg. My thanks are also due to Dr. Losch of the Prussian State Library in Berlin, Dr. A. Richel at Frankfurt and the staff of the Municipal Museum in that city who, together with the director of the portrait collection in the Vienna National Library, Hofer Drive Rottinger and Dr. Wilhelm Beetz, who so kindly assisted me with the illustrations. The material was collected for over a period of three and a half years, and only after much care has been spent on it do I now offer it to the public. It is submitted in the hope that it will be judged in accordance with its intentions. It is inspired by an intense love of truth, 
and it relates the story of an unseen but infinitely powerful driving force which permeated the whole of the 19th century. The author Vienna, July, 1927. The Rise of the House of Rothschild. Chapter 1. The Origins and the Early Activities of the Frankfurt Family Rothschild. Frankfurt on the Main, seat of the imperial elections since the Golden Bull of 1356, acquired a dominating position amongst the great cities of Germany during the second half of the 18th century. Formerly the capital of the Kingdom of the East Franks, it had become subject of the empire alone as early as 1245, and in spite of many vicissitudes it had maintained its leading position throughout the centuries. It expanded considerably during the last few centuries before the French Revolution and now numbered some 35,000 inhabitants, of whom one-tenth were Jews. By virtue of its natural position, lying so close to the great waterway of the Rhine and to the frontiers of France and Holland, it had become the gateway for the trade of Germany with the Western states. Trade with England too constituted an important element in the activities of its inhabitants. It was natural that members of the Jewish race, with their special gifts for trade and finance, should be particularly attracted to this city. Moreover, towards the end of the Middle Ages the Jews in Frankfurt enjoyed a great measure of freedom, and at first no difficulties were placed in the way of their settlement. It was not until the non-Jewish members of the business community at Worms saw that they were suffering from the competition of these enterprising people that the Christian citizens combined in their superior numbers now began a period of harsh oppression for the Jewish inhabitants. In order that they might be removed from the neighborhood of the most important church in the town, they were ordered by a law passed in the year 1462 to leave the houses they had been living in and to settle in a quarter set aside for the purpose, the so-called Jewish city. This, however, consisted only of a single dark alley, about twelve feet broad, and lay, as described by Goethe, between the city wall and a trench. For more than 300 years this continued to be the sole residence of the Frankfurt Jews, whose continuance in the city became more and more unpopular with the other inhabitants. As early as the second decade of the 17th century a rising broke out under one fat Mielch, one of the objects of which was to drive the Jews out of Frankfurt. This object was indeed achieved through murder and pillage. Although the Jews soon returned to the city, they had to submit to innumerable restrictions and regulations embodied in a special law dealing with the so-called status of Jews. They were made subject to a poll tax, and were compelled, as being a foreign element in the town, to purchase the protection of their persons and property. Hence they came to be called protected Jews. The number of their families was to be limited to 500 and only 12 marriages a year were allowed, although this number might be increased if a family died out. The Jews were not allowed to acquire land, or to practice farming or handicrafts. They were also forbidden to trade in various commodities, such as fruit, weapons and silk. Moreover, except during fairs, they were forbidden to offer their wares anywhere except outside the Jewish quarter. They were forbidden to leave the space within the ghetto. The origins of the Rothschilds' walls by night, or on Sundays or holy days. If a Jew crossed a bridge he had to pay a fee for doing so. They were not allowed to visit public taverns and were excluded from the more attractive walks in the city. The Jews accordingly did not stand high in public esteem. When they appeared in public, they were often greeted with shouts of contempt and stones were sometimes thrown at them. Bonan has stated that any street urchin could say to a passing Jew, Jew, do your duty, and the Jew then had to step aside and take off his hat. However that may be, the oppressed condition of the Jews and the bent of many of them to usury, combined with the natural hostility of the Christians and their feeling that they were not as sharp in business, created an atmosphere of mutual hatred that can scarcely have been more painful anywhere than in Frankfurt. The progenitors of the House of Rothschild lived under conditions such as those in the ghetto of Frankfurt. The earlier ancestors of Mayor Emil Rothschild, who laid the foundations of the future greatness of the house, existed in the middle of the 16th century. We know their names, and their tombs have been preserved in the old Jewish cemetery at Frankfurt. Formerly the houses in the Jewish quarter were not numbered, each house being distinguished by a shield of a particular color or by a sign. The house in which the members of the Rothschild family lived bore a small red shield. There is no doubt that it is to this fact that they owe their family name. 
It is first mentioned in 1585 in the name Isaac Elkanan at the Red Shield, his father's tombstone simply bearing the name Elkanan. About a century later Naphtali Hertz at the Red Shield left the ruinous old building from which the family had derived its name, and occupied the so-called House Sir and Terpfawn, in which the Rothschilds were now domiciled as protected Jews. Until the time when Mayor Emil Rothschild, who was born in the year 1743, six years before Goethe, reached manhood, the family were principally engaged in various kinds of retail trade. At the beginning of the 18th century they had become money changers in a small way. From the occasional records of their tax payments which had been preserved, it would appear that they were not a poor Jewish family, but that they were only reasonably well off. In any case it is clear that Mayor Emil came into some small inheritance when, in 1755, in his twelfth year, he lost his father and mother, of whom he was the eldest son. This gave him the incentive to throw himself into the battle of life with that vigor and industry which his parents had implanted in him in his early childhood. In the conditions of those times the struggle was certainly much more severe for a young Jew than for his more fortunate Christian neighbors. When he was a boy of ten Mayor Emil had been employed by his father in changing coins of every kind, that is, in exchanging gold and silver for the appropriate amount of copper known as coarse money. In the chaotic conditions prevailing in Germany, divided as the country was into innumerable small principalities, cities and spiritual jurisdictions, all of which had their own currency systems, the business of money changing offered magnificent opportunities of profit, since everybody was compelled, before undertaking even the shortest journey, to call for the assistance of the exchange merchant. As the boy grew up, an important side interest developed out of this occupation as he occasionally became possessed of rare and historically valuable coins, which awoke in him the instincts of the coin collector. After leaving the school at Firth, where he was educated in the Jewish faith, Mayor Emil entered the firm of Oppenheim at Hanover. While there he happened to make the acquaintance of the Hanoverian general von Estoff, an ardent coin collector, who employed him to obtain many valuable coins for his collection. As the general was connected with the ruling house in Hesse, this acquaintance was to have fruitful results. In his spare time Mayor Emil now devoted himself more and more to numismatics. He got hold of any papers about the subject that he could, and in course of time became an expert in his subject, although his general education left a very great deal to be desired. At a comparatively early age he returned to his native city of Frankfurt, in order to take possession of his inheritance, and having done so, to lay the foundations of a business of his own. For this he had received a practical education from his earliest youth, both at home and at Hanover. About the same time General von Estoff left Hanover for the court of Prince William of Hesse, the grandson of the old Landgrave William VIII, who resided at Hesse. He proceeded to the small town of Hanau, which lies quite close to Frankfurt. The prince's father Frederick II of Hesse had married a daughter of King George III of England of the House of Hanover, and the two rulers used their family relationships to consolidate their dynastic and political interests. The sale of soldiers for service under foreign governments, practiced by so many German princes at this time, was an important part of their activities. England, being particularly accustomed to carrying on wars with foreign mercenaries, was an exceedingly good customer. Unfortunately Frederick II fell out with his wife, his father, and his father-in-law, because he changed over from the Protestant to the Catholic faith. In order to protect his grandson from his father's influence the old Landgrave decided that William was to be kept away from Castle, and allotted the county of Hanau to him. Until he should be able to assume the rulership of that province he was sent to King Frederick V of Denmark, who had married the second daughter of the King of England, and whose daughter was destined to be the future bride of young William. The relations of the ruling House of Hesse with England and Denmark were to be fraught with the most important consequences for the rise of the House of Rothschild, which was enabled to make use of the close business connection that it succeeded in establishing with the ruling House of Hesse, to get into touch with the courts and the leading statesmen of Denmark and England. The old Landgrave William VIII died in 1760. Frederick assumed the government at Kassel, and William became Crown Prince and as the bridegroom of the Danish princess he became, in accordance with the will of his grandfather, independent ruler of the small county of Hanau with its 50,000 inhabitants, 
to whose interests he devoted himself with the greatest zeal. William was a thoroughly active person, and was never idle for a moment. He read a great deal, and actually wrote some essays on matters of local historical interest. He also tried his hand, though without any great success, at etching, modeling and carpentering, and he had a very definite flair for collecting. It would appear that General von Estef aroused his ruler's interest in coin collecting. In 1763 William adopted this hobby with great enthusiasm, and it afforded him much pleasure and satisfaction. Estef spoke to him about Mayor Emil Rothschild, who had bought coins for him in Hanover in former days, as being a great expert in that line. 3. On the strength of this introduction Rothschild selected some of his finest medals and rarest coins, and went to Hanau to offer them to the young prince. He did not succeed in seeing him personally, but he managed to hand them to someone in the prince's immediate entourage. This offer proved to be the starting point of a lasting business connection, even though at first it was of a quite loose and impersonal nature. At that time a large number of foreigners used to visit Frankfurt every spring. The town fairs were widely famous, the latest products of the whole world were on view there, and young William of Hanau, who had a talent for business, took a special interest in these fairs and constantly attended them. Mayor Emil always managed to get advance information about these journeys from the prince's servants, and profited by these occasions to offer William while he was in Frankfurt not only rare coins but also precious stones and antiques. Although this was principally done through the prince's retinue, he sometimes managed to conduct these transactions personally, and in any case he managed to establish a regular business relationship. He was fortunate in that the prince did not share the general aversion to Jews, and appreciated anyone who seemed intelligent and good at business, and whom he thought he could use in his own interests. At that time titles and honors were of far greater practical importance than they are today. Unless a person had some kind of prefix or suffix all doors were closed to him, and everyone who did not have a title of nobility by the accident of birth would endeavor to obtain an office, or at any rate an official title, from someone of the innumerable counts or princelings who in that day still enjoyed sovereign rights. Mayor Emil Rothschild, being a shrewd man with an astonishing knowledge of human nature for his years, he was only twenty-five, concentrated on using his connection with the Prince of Hanau to obtain a court title. He hoped thereby not merely to raise his prestige generally, but more particularly to advance his relations with other princes interested in coins. In 1769 he wrote a most humble petition for to the Prince of Hanau, in which, after referring to various goods delivered to the prince to his highness's most gracious satisfaction, he begged that he might most graciously be granted the advantage of being appointed court agent. Mayor Emil promised always to devote all his energy and property to the prince's service, and he concluded his letter with a perfectly sincere statement that if he received the designation in question he hoped thereby to gain business esteem, and that it would otherwise enable him to make his fortune in the city of Frankfurt. This letter, which was written in a style expressive of extreme humility, was the first of an almost endless series of petitions which the various members of the House of Rothschild were to address in the course of the nineteenth century to those occupying the seats of the mighty. Many of these were favorably considered, and assisted no little in establishing the fortunes of that house. This, the first of the series, was granted, and the nomination was duly carried into effect on September 21, 1769. Henceforth to the name of Rothschild was attached the decorative suffix crown agent to the Principality of Hesse Hanau. This more or less corresponded with the present-day practice under which a tradesman may display the royal coat of arms with the legend by special appointment, etc. It was a mere designation carrying no obligation, and although it gave expression to the fact that a businessman enjoyed the patronage of a customer in the highest circles, it did not imply any official status whatever. Nevertheless this first success gave much joy to Mayor Emil, since it not only enabled him to make great profits in his old coin business, but gave his firm a special prestige with the world at large, as even the smallest prince shed a certain glamour upon all who came anywhere near his magic circle. And the Prince of Hanau was grandson of the King of England, husband of the daughter of the King of Denmark, and destined to be the ruler of Hesse Castle. At the age of twenty-five Mayor Emil was a tall, impressive-looking man of pronounced Hebraic type. 
his expression, if rather sly, was good-natured. In accordance with the custom of those times he wore a wig, although, as he was a Jew, he was not allowed to have it powdered, and in accordance with the customs of his race he wore a small, pointed black beard. When he took stock of his business and his little property, he could say to himself with justice that he had not merely administered his inheritance intelligently, but substantially increased it. Although he could certainly not be classed amongst the wealthy men of Frankfurt, or even amongst the wealthy Jews of that city, he could assuredly be described as well off, and was in a position to think of founding a family. He had been attracted for some time by the youthful daughter of a tradesman called Wolf Solomon Schnapper, who lived not far from the Rothschilds' house in the Jewish quarter. She was seventeen years old when Mayor Emil courted her, had been brought up in all the domestic virtues, was simple and modest, and exceedingly industrious, and brought a dowry with her which, though small, was in solid cash. Mayor Emil's marriage was celebrated on August 29, 1770. After his marriage he would have liked to move from the house Sir in Terpfhorn, which he rented, into a house of his own, but he could not yet afford to do so. The young couple's first child, a daughter, was born as early as 1771, after which followed three boys in the years 1773, 1774, 1775, who were given the names Amal, Solomon, and Nathan. While his wife was fully occupied in bringing up the children and running the house, Mayor Amal developed his business, in which his invalid brother Kalman was a partner until he died in 1782. Without neglecting his ordinary business of money changing, he bought several collections of coins from needy aristocratic collectors in the district, and he had an antique coin catalogue of his own printed, which he circulated widely, especially among such princes as were interested in numismatics. He sent such catalogues to Goethe's patron Duke Karl August of Weimar, to Duke Karl Theodore of the Palatinate, and of course always to his own benefactor at Hanau, five Prince William. The prince's mother still kept him away from his father, Landgrave Frederick, who was ruling at Castle, and who made several unsuccessful attempts to get into touch with his son. William had married Princess Caroline of Denmark six years before Mayor Emil's marriage. But from the first moment of their union they had realized that they were not suited six to one another. Indeed so little physical or spiritual harmony was there between the young couple that their marriage might be regarded as an absolute affliction. It finally led to William's entirely neglecting his wife and living with numerous favourites, who bore him children. The families Haynau, Heimrod, and Hessenstein are the descendants of such unions, it being William's practice to obtain titles for his illegitimate children from the Emperor of Austria, in return for the monies he lent to him. It is difficult to verify the fantastic figures seven given as to the total number of his illegitimate children. But there is no doubt they were very numerous. When he assumed the government of his small territory, William of Hanau was in a position to play the role of absolute ruler, and his highly marked individuality immediately made itself felt. He was insolent even with the nobility, and often observed that he did not like them to take advantage of any marks of familiar condescension that he showed them. On the other hand, he did not show any pride in dealing with persons who he thought would serve his interests. He was exceedingly suspicious, quick to see a point, and easily made angry, especially if his divine right was questioned. He held broad views in religious matters, associated much with Freemasons and practiced complete religious tolerance. Under his rule the Jews enjoyed all kinds of liberties. They did not, for instance, have to display in the market signs to distinguish them from Christian tradespeople. Indeed William took pleasure in their Mark talent for business, for in this matter he felt himself to be a kindred spirit. Business considerations governed him even when he was specifically considering the welfare of his soldiers. He would concern himself with the smallest details of their equipment, would pass the new recruits, and would give precise instructions as to the length of the pigtail to be worn. He was particularly fond of parades, and tortured his men with drill and button polishing. One reason he was particularly anxious that his troops should look smart was that he could make a great deal of money by following the example of his father and grandfather in selling his men to England. His father Landgrave Frederick had in this way gradually transferred to England 12,000 Hessians, and amassed an enormous fortune in the process. 
In the same way William sold to England in 1776 the small Hanau Regiment, which he had just formed. The conditions of such subsidy contracts were exceedingly oppressive to the customer, as he had to pay substantial compensation for any man who was killed or wounded. The Crown Prince also increased his property considerably by this means. After deducting all expenses he realized a net profit of about 3,500,000 marks from this business, and there being no distinction between the public and the private purse of a prince, this money was at his absolute personal disposal. In spite of his princely origin, such were the business instincts of this talented young man that this financial success simply whetted his appetite for amassing greater riches. Had William not been destined to succeed to the throne of Hesse, he would have been an outstandingly successful man of business. As it was he found such outlet as he could for his commercial instincts within the sphere of his princely dignity. Father and son continued to accumulate large capital sums, and they refrained from bringing over to the continent substantial proportions of the subsidy monies, which they invested in England itself. The management of these funds was entrusted to the Amsterdam financial house Van den Notten. England did not always pay in cash, but often in bills of exchange that had to be discounted. For this purpose the prince and his officials had to employ suitable middlemen in large commercial centres like Frankfurt. Although the middlemen had to get their profit out of the business they could not be dispensed with in view of the restricted means of transport and communication at that time. Purchases and sales had to be carefully regulated to prevent the market from being suddenly flooded with bills, the rate of exchange being consequently depressed. This work fell to the various crown agents and factors. Of these the Jew Vidal David was the principal one attached to the Landgrave at Castle, Rothschild being employed only by the crown prince at Hanau, and only in exchange business and to a limited extent in conjunction with several others. His personal relation with the prince was at first exceedingly slender, for, however enlightened he might be, a ruling prince did not easily associate with a Jew, and only long years of useful service, acting upon a temperament such as William's, could break down such natural obstacles. In the first instance men of business had to deal with the crown prince's officials. To get on good terms with them was a primary essential for anybody who wanted to do business with the prince. One of the most influential members of the Crown Prince's civil service was an official at the Treasury called Karl Frederick Buderus. He was the son of a Hanau schoolmaster, and had shown a special aptitude for the duties of a careful and accurate Treasury clerk. His father had been writing and music master to the children of the Crown Prince's mistress Frau von Ritter Leindenthal, ancestress of the Hanaus, and this had given him the opportunity of bringing to the Crown Prince's attention a plan of his sons for increasing the milk profits from one of the prince's dairies by the simple expedient of forbidding the practice, adopted by the office concerned, of omitting fractions of a heller in the accounts. Young Buddhist showed that this would increase the revenue by 120 talos. This discovery appealed so strongly to the avaricious prince, who counted every halfpenny, that he entrusted Buderus with the accounts of his private purse, in addition to his normal duties. Buderus henceforth displayed the greatest zeal in looking after the financial interests of the Crown Prince. He is generally credited with having been responsible for the introduction of the salt tax when the problem of providing for the prince's innumerable natural children became pressing. The resulting increase in the cost of this important article of diet was heavily felt, especially by the poorest inhabitants of Hess Castle. There being no distinction between the public treasury and the private purse we can readily imagine how great this man's influence has. Moreover, the officials of that period were always personally interested on a percentage basis in the financial dealings which they carried through in their official capacity. By arrangement with amenable crown agents with whom they had to deal they could, without any suggestion of bribery, or of acting against the influence of their master, easily so arrange matters that their personal interests would be better served by a clever agent than by one who was less adaptable. Mayor Amor brought to his work a certain natural flair for psychology, and he always endeavoured to create personal links wherever he possibly could. He naturally made a special point of being on good terms with the Hanau treasury officials, and especially with Buderus. They, however, had not as yet sufficient confidence in the financial resources of the Frankfurt Jew Rothschild to entrust to him anything except the smaller transactions. Through the death of Landgrave Frederick, the crown prince suddenly succeeded to the throne of Hesse Castle, 
and to the most extensive property of any German prince of that period. On October 31, 1785, his father Frederick II had suddenly had a stroke during his midday meal and had fallen off his chair, dying a few minutes later. This news came as a complete surprise to the crown prince, as his father had latterly scarcely ever been ill. William of Hanau accordingly succeeded to the throne of Hesse Castle as Landgrave William D.C. On reading his father's will he learned with pleasure that the country was free of debt, and that he had come into an enormous property. The subsidies received for the sale of mercenaries had been most profitably invested, and estimates the value of the inheritance varied between 20 and 60 million thalers, unparalleled sums for those times. The new Landgrave united his private property at Hanau with his inherited possessions, and now found himself disposing of an amount of money which conferred far greater power on him than his new dignity. He moved his residence from Hanau, which was close to Frankfurt, to Kassel, which lay much farther north, with the result that Mayor Emil Rothschild's relations with the Hessian court at first suffered from the greater distance which separated him from his patron. But the Jewish tradesman was determined not to lose such a useful connection without a struggle. In order to remind the new Landgrave of his existence he visited Castle again in 1787, bringing with him a remarkably beautiful collection of coins, medals, and jeweled gold chains, and offered these wares to the Landgrave at exceptionally low prices. The prince at once appreciated the real value of the articles, and eagerly did business with Mayor Amor, who took advantage of the opportunity to submit the humble request that he should not be forgotten if any future bills of exchange required discounting, or the prince wanted to purchase English coins. Rothschild had deliberately made a loss on these small deals in order to secure the chance of much more profitable business in the future, and his valuable articles were readily purchased from him because they were cheap, promises being freely made with regard to the future. But two years passed without his services being asked for. He stood by enviously, seeing other agents getting bills to discount, and being asked to pay interest only after six or eight months, or else to pay over the money in installments, an arrangement equivalent to allowing the firm's concerned substantial free credits. Rothschild had closely followed the business dealings of these firms, and had thought out a very useful way of transacting such matters if he should be entrusted with them. He decided to pay another call at Castle. During the summer of 1789 he wrote a letter to the Landgrave in which he referred to the services that he had rendered during a long course of years as Hess Hanau Crown Agent, and asked to be considered in connection with the bills of exchange business on a credit basis. In order to put himself on a level with his rivals he promised always to do business at a price at least as high as that offered by any banker in Gassel. The petition, which shows that Rothschild already had control of considerable sums of money, was submitted to the Landgrave by Buderus, but William decided that he must first obtain further information about Rothschild's business. His inquiries all produced satisfactory results. Mayor Emil was described as being punctual in his payments, and as being an energetic and honourable man, who therefore deserved to be granted credit, even if precise figures regarding the extent of his possessions could not be obtained. Nevertheless, Rothschild received only a comparatively small credit transaction to carry out, whilst simultaneously a transaction thirty times as great was entrusted to Vidal David. But, though modest, it was a beginning. Buderus, whose position in the meantime had been steadily increasing in importance, often had occasion to travel between Kassel and Frankfurt on business matters. We have evidence of the fact that as early as 1790 he had business dealings with Rothschild's father-in-law Wolf Solomon Schnapper, and it was Schnapper who brought him and Mayor Emil together. Rothschild would often get advance information of Buderus's journeys to Frankfurt so that he could go and see him when he came. The Hessian official heard from other sources in Frankfurt of the clever Jew's rising reputation, and of how he always met his obligations punctually. Buderus was also gradually influenced by Rothschild's own persuasive powers. As early as November, 1790, Buderus's accounts contain an entry regarding a draft of 2000 Loeb Taylor to the order of the Crown Agent Mayor Emil Rothschild. Rothschild now urged Buderus, if occasion should arise, to recommend him to the Landgrave for substantial dealings also. In 1794 an opportunity for this occurred. The capital sums invested by Hess in England had grown to a very considerable amount, 
and the Landgrave gave instructions that a portion of them should be brought over to Kassel. In addition to the Christian banking firm of Simon Moritz von Bethmann, which had been established in Frankfurt for centuries, and four other firms, Buda has put forward the name of the Crown agent Rothschild as suitable for carrying through this transaction. The Landgrave, however, attached far too much importance to his old connection with Bethmann, at that time the outstanding banking firm in Germany, and with the other old established firms, and on this occasion too Rothschild was left out. But it did not occur again. In the end Buderus's efforts were successful in overcoming the Landgrave's aversion, and henceforward Rothschild also was employed to an increasing extent in discounting bills and in other business. His dealings with the court at Castle soon became very active, and as Mayor Amel carried through the matters entrusted to him, not merely conscientiously but with a shrewd eye to gain, the profits which he derived from them increased considerably. It was necessary for the young household that business should be brisk, for in 1788 another son, Karl Mayer, was born, and in 1792 a fifth son Jacob, called James, and Mayer Amel's marriage had also been blessed with five daughters. There was the large family of twelve persons to feed. However, Mayor Amel's flourishing business was not merely adequate to support his family, but there was a considerable and constantly increasing surplus available for increasing his business capital. In 1785, as an outward and visible sign of his increasing prosperity, he bought a handsome residence, the house known as Umgrenenschild, while he transferred to a relative the house Sir and Terpfon in which he had lived hitherto, and which he had partially purchased since being nominated Crown Agend. The house into which the Rothschild family now moved is still standing almost as it was then. It is the right half of a building comprising two quite small family dwellings, typical of the straitened circumstances of the Jewish quarter. Only the three left windows of the house front belonged to the Rothschilds, and above the first door was a small, scarcely noticeable five-sided convex green shield. The right half of the building, known as the House Sir Arch, belonged to the Jewish family Schiff who kept a second-hand shop in it. Over the door was a small carved chip representing the boat of Columbus. As the door of the Rothschild house was opened, an ancient bell was set ringing, sending its warning notes right through the house. Every step one took revealed the painful congestion in which the Jews of that period were compelled to exist, the only quarters where they were allowed to live being comprised within the small and narrow Jew street. Everything in the house was very narrow, and each particle of space was turned to account. A creaking wooden staircase, underneath which cupboards had been built in, led to the upper floor, and to the little green room of Gadula, the mistress of the house, so called because the modest furniture in it was upholstered in green. In a glass case on the table was the withered bridal wreath of Mayor Amel's wife. Let into the left wall was a small secret cupboard, concealed by a mirror hanging in front of it. In this matter, too, Space was carefully utilized, there being cupboards built into the wall wherever possible, such as are now coming into use again. On the ground floor was the parents' small bedroom, while the numerous children had to share one other little room. A narrow passage led to a kind of roof terrace, a tiny roof garden with a few plants. As the Jews were not allowed in the public gardens this roof garden furnished a modest substitute, and served as the family recreation ground. As it is laid down that the Feast of the Tabernacle must be celebrated in the open air, and there was no other place available, the little roof garden was used for this purpose. Behind the house, and overlooking the narrow courtyard, was a room about nine feet square, which was actually the first banking house of the Rothschilds. Its most important article of furniture was a large iron chest with an enormous padlock. However, the lock was so contrived that the chest could not be opened on the side where the lock was but only by lifting the lid from the back. In this room too, there were secret shelves cleverly concealed in the walls. The kitchen of the house was very modest, the room being about twelve feet long and only about five feet broad. A tiny half, which could accommodate only one cooking pot, a chest, and a bench were about all that it contained. There was one fixture that constituted a great luxury for those times, a primitive pump which conveyed drinking water direct to the kitchen. Such was the scene of the early activities of Mayor Amel and his sons, whose energy and enterprise laid the foundations for the future development of their house. 
Bergerifer's researches indicate that the annual income of the House of Rothschild, before the war period of the 1790s, may be estimated at between 2,000 and 3,000 gulden. 16 We are better able to realize what this meant when we consider that the expenditure of Goethe's family, who were people of position, was about 2,400 gulden a year. On such an income it was possible to live quite comfortably at Frankfurt at that time, although the political disturbances which were developing soon began to produce their effect. Events profoundly affecting the course of all future history had taken place. The repercussions of the French Revolution were felt throughout Europe. There was no one, whether prince or peasant, who did not directly or indirectly feel it's the principle of equality which it proclaimed aroused emotions of hope or dismay throughout the world, according to the social position of each individual, on the standards of the revolutionary armies was inscribed their determination to extend the benefits of their achievements throughout the world, and those who had seized the reins of power were soon to aim at world dominion. This fact constituted a special menace to the German princes whose territories bordered on France. The refugees of the French nobility flooded Germany, and many of them arrived at the castle court. Landgrave William had occasion to hear many of the terrible stories told by the emigrants who had lost their nearest relatives under the guillotine, and had been forced to go abroad as homeless refugees reduced to absolute poverty. The impression gained from the sufferers themselves. The news regarding the threatened execution of the king and his consort, and the reports of the cruel treatment meted out to all who enjoyed princely or noble privileges caused him to tremble for his crown, as all the princes of Europe were trembling. He was also concerned about his enormous wealth, a special source of danger at such a time. And he therefore did not require much pressing to join the great coalition of princes against revolutionary France. At the head of this coalition was Francis of Austria who was shortly to be elected emperor, and who had been the first to ally himself with Prussia against France. Landgrave William attached particular importance to his relations with the man who was shortly to be emperor, and in a letter to the most excellent, most puissant king and highly honoured cousin he hastened to promise his military help as a proof of his most special devotion to your high wishes. Francis of Austria expressed his gratitude and observed that this should serve as an example to others, especially as not only every territorial prince and government of whatever kind they may be, but also every private person possessed of any property, or who has been blessed by God with any possessions or rights acquired by inheritance or otherwise must realize with ever-growing conviction. That the war is a universal war declared upon all states, all forms of government, and even upon all forms of private property, and any orderly regulation of human society, as is clearly proved by the chaotic condition and internal desolation of France and her raging determination to spread similar conditions throughout the world. But the Union of Princes had much underrated the offensive of revolutionary France. Under the handicap of bad leadership and lack of unity the Allies were unable to prevail against the revolutionary armies, inspired by the ideals of liberty and nationalism. Prussia and Hesse were forced to retire. And the French general de Custin actually succeeded in crossing the Rhine in 1792 and reaching Frankfurt, with the result that William retired in a panic to Kessel, greatly concerned about his crown treasures. With rage and indignation he read the French manifesto to the Hessian soldiers which urged them to forsake the tyrant and tiger who sold their blood in order to fill his chest. The Landgrave finally succeeded in driving the small French force out of Frankfurt. This cost him a considerable sum of money but his loss was made good by a new subsidy contract under which he delivered 8,000 Hessian soldiers to England, which had joined the coalition against France. Mayor Emil Rothschild and his rivals were kept fully occupied in discounting the bills received from England in connection with this transaction. When, in 1795, Prussia withdrew from the war against the French Republic, the Landgrave of Hesse followed her example. His ambition now was to have the calm. Paratively modest title of Landgrave changed, and to attain electoral rank. In the meantime he had been created a field marshal of Prussia, and in 1796, when Napoleon's star was in the ascendant, relations between the two countries were particularly cordial. In spite, however, of the secession of Prussia and Hesse, England and Austria continued to carry on the war of the coalition with varying success. Whilst Bonaparte was victorious in Italy, 
the Archduke Karl gained a series of successes in the south of Germany. Frankfurt had to suffer again. From the vicissitudes of war. On July 13, 1796, it was actually bombarded by the French with the result that some of the houses in the Jewish quarter, 156 buildings including the synagogue, most of which were inferior wooden structures, were set on fire. The Rothschild House, which was one of the best constructed buildings in the street, suffered only slight damage. In view of the time required to rebuild these houses a departure had to be made from the ghetto precinct, and the Jews had to be allowed to reside and trade outside the strictly defined boundary. The Rothschilds were among those who took advantage of this favorable opportunity, and transferred their merchandise business, they were dealing increasingly in war requirements such as cloth, foodstuffs, and wine, to the Schnurgas which lay near the center of the town, renting accommodation at a leather dealer's. The military developments of the First Coalition War, in which Mayor Amel's princely customer at Castle was actively engaged with varying fortunes, entailed considerably increased activity on the part of the various Crown agents in the Landgrave's service. Although the war had caused not a little damage to Frankfurt it had brought the town certain indirect advantages. The Frankfurt Boers benefited by the decline of the Amsterdam Boers which had hitherto held a dominating position, and which almost completely collapsed when the French conquered Holland in 1795. The result was that much more business came the way of the Frankfurt bankers, and Mayor Emil Rothschild's financial and trading business, which was closely associated with war requirements, increased by leaps and bounds. The war profits realized at the time formed the real foundation of the enormous fortune that was later built up by the House of Rothschild. It was of course impossible any longer completely to conceal such large profits. Until 1794 the family property had for twenty years been assessed at the constant figure of only 2,000 gulden, and they had paid taxes in accordance with this assessment, amounting to about 13 gulden annually. Suddenly in the year 1795 this amount was doubled, and in the year after that Rothschild was included amongst those whose property was worth 15,000 gulden or more that being the highest figure adopted for assessment purposes. Meanwhile the three eldest sons had grown up, and after the age of twenty were associated with their father in the business to an increasing extent. Like their two eldest sisters they were placed in responsible positions and rendered active assistance to their father. A large family, which to so many people is a cause of worry and anxiety, was in this case a positive blessing as there was abundance of work for everybody. It made it unnecessary for Mayor Amel to take strangers into his business and let them into the various secret and subtle moves of the game. Since the number of available children increased in proportion as the business expanded, it was possible to keep all the confidential positions in the family. The strong traditional community and family sense of the Jews, reinforced by persecution from outside, compelling them to unite in their own defense, did wonders. The two eldest sons had been zealously engaged in the business from boyhood, and their father wisely encouraged them by letting them share personally in the business, apart from the general family interest in its prosperity. When the eldest daughter married, in 1795, the son-in-law Moses Worms was not employed in the business, but when the eldest son Emil Mayer married in 1796, the daughter-in-law Eva Hanau was given a post. In spite of the growing number of available members of the family, Mayor Emil found it necessary also to engage bookkeepers with a knowledge of languages, as the Rothschild family at that time were all quite uneducated, speaking and writing only a bad kind of Frankfurt Yiddish German, apart from Hebrew. And in view of their expanding connections with persons in the highest circles they had to pay particular attention to matters of epistolary style. As the only person he could find capable of carrying out this work, was a Christian girl, Rothschild did not hesitate to take her into the business. It was at this period that Mayor Emil entered into a highly elaborate deed of partnership with his two eldest sons, which provided that profits and losses should be divided between the three partners according to a definite scheme. The growing demands upon the treasury arising out of the war served to develop the relations with the Landgrave of Hesse. After the separate peace of Basel William of Hesse adopted the attitude of an impartial observer of the warlike activities in Europe, and occupied himself principally in the profitable administration of his extensive possessions. He was no stranger to the authentic delights of avarice. 
Great though his wealth was, his appetite for increasing it remained keen. He showed the greatest ingenuity in effecting savings of every kind, and spent all his spare time thinking out schemes for the profitable investment of the large cash resources which were accumulating in his treasury. The ruling Landgrave gradually became a banker to the whole world, advancing his money not only to princes and nobles, but also to small shopkeepers and Jews, and even to artisans, where he could get good interest. The amounts lent ranged from hundreds of thousands to a few thalers, according to the financial repute of his customers. Cobblers and tailors paid the same rate of interest for small advances as princes for heavy ones. The debts were all accurately registered in account books, making up an enormous number of volumes. If a banker wanted to borrow from him he had to deposit government securities with the land rave. Thus his enormous fortune consisted of cash, jewels, art treasures and coins, as well as acknowledgments of sums lent and debenture certificates deposited as security. The withdrawal in 1795 of Prussia and Hesse from the war against France had resulted in the temporary estrangement of the Austrian Emperor Francis. But he and the Landgrave soon re-established cordial relations, for each of them had need of the other. William desired support in the acquisition of territory, and in his efforts to attain the dignity of elector while the emperor was sadly in lack of funds owing to the long war with France. The Landgrave therefore asked the emperor's support in his aims. The emperor wrote on September 8, 1797, to say that he appreciated the efforts which his cousin was making on his behalf, and was grateful to learn that the Landgrave was sympathetic to his need for a loan. I also believe, he wrote, as it is my duty to do, in your sentiments of loyalty to me and to my house, of which I have received special proof in the matter of the loan that is being negotiated by Herr Kornrumpf. I flatter myself that Your Highness will carry this through to my complete satisfaction. Your Highness may rest assured that for my part one sincerely wished to be of service to you also. The details of such transactions were generally negotiated by Jewish agents, and although Mayor Amel was not employed on this occasion, he was soon to serve as the middleman between the Landgrave and the Emperor. This was made possible by the fact that Rothschild's wealth had increased rapidly during the last years of the war. Towards the end of the 18th century it cannot have been far short of a million gulden. The transfer of bills of exchange, cash payments, and the consignments of merchandise from England, the principal supply of the Frankfurter Platz, which in its turn, supplied the whole of Germany, made it necessary to appoint a representative on the other side of the channel. As it was essential that any such representative should be a trustworthy person, the obvious thing was to appoint one of the live sons. The two eldest, Emil and Solomon, who, in 1798, were 25 and 24 years old respectively, were thoroughly initiated into the Frankfurt business. The third son, Nathan, a highly gifted young man of 21, intensely industrious and with a very independent spirit, felt that his elder brothers did not give him sufficient scope. In spite of his youth, he too benefited by the wise arrangements of his father, and had his own personal share in the business and in the family property. As the continental states, owing to war and revolution, produced much less, but consumed a great deal more than in normal times, English commercial travellers swarmed over the continent of Europe and in 1798, one of them called it the Rothschild's house of business, and was received by Nathan. English commercial travellers of that period were exceedingly conscious of the commercial and political supremacy of their country, and they were wont to adopt an arrogant manner, as they felt that the continent was dependent upon their goods. The Englishman's manner annoyed Nathan Rothschild, and he met his arrogance with brusqueness whereupon the foreigner took his departure. This incident was the immediate cause that decided Nathan to propose to his father that he should go to England himself, in order to become a merchant there on his own account and also to represent the firm of Rothschild generally. His father and brothers did not show any opposition to the enterprising young man and supported his decision in every way. Nathan took as much ready money with him as was practicable and the rest he had sent on after him. The capital which he brought with him to England amounted altogether to a sum of about £20,000 or a quarter of a million gulden. About a fifth of this sum was his own money. The rest belonged to the business. 
the action of his father and brothers showed great confidence in this young man who did not even know the language of the country he was about to enter as a complete stranger. Their confidence was to be justified, for Nathan was destined to become the outstanding figure in the Rothschild business. This first branch establishment of the House of Rothschild resulted from the family relationships and the requirements of the trade with England, without any preconceived plan, and without the remotest idea of the importance of this step for the future of the business. The Napoleonic Epoch, which followed upon the French Revolution, was to be the occasion for the foundation of the second branch in Paris and for the first collaboration between the brothers Rothschild in Frankfurt, London, and Paris. Chapter 2. The Rothschild Family During the Napoleonic Era The turn of the century coincided with an important part of the wars against the French Republic, arising out of the Revolution. The Peace of Lunaville, concluded in 1801, had set the seal on the brilliant Bonaparte's territorial victories, thereby giving France the leadership on land, while, however, England's preeminence at sea was confirmed. Although Bonaparte had overcome all his other enemies, he was bound to admit that sea girt England had maintained its position. The Treaty of Amiens, which followed upon that of Lunaville, merely marked a transition stage, and was bound to lead to a resumption of the struggle, until one of the two great opponents should lie bleeding on the ground. This struggle was the predominant feature of the next fifteen years, and converted almost the whole of the mainland of Europe into a theatre of war. The result was that innumerable substantial firms, banks, and private persons lost their property, while on the other hand persons possessing industry, energy, and resource, with a flair for turning opportunity to account, were enabled to gain riches and power. At any rate within their own caste, the Rothschild family had at that time achieved a position in which their future was bound to be profoundly affected by political developments. As early as 1800 their father Mayor Emil had been the tenth richest Jew in Frankfurt. The only question was as to the attitude that the head of the business house and his sons would take in the stormy times that were to follow. Numerous competitors were richer than they, or as rich, had better and older connections, and some had been received into the Christian church and no longer suffered from the stigma of Judaism. The Rothschilds, on the other hand, had the advantage of a chief who was industrious, energetic, and reliable, and a man of intelligence. He had to help him for hard-working sons who were developing into first-rate businessmen under the guidance of their father. One of these, Solomon, had just married Caroline Stern, herself the prosperous daughter of a Frankfurt tradesman, and had thus been enabled to found a home of his own. The third son Nathan was living in the camp of Napoleon's great enemy England. In Hat Country with its sea power and its worldwide commerce, his undertakings were far better protected against Napoleonic interference than those of his father and brothers on the continent. He was able to form a much more dispassionate judgment of the great events which followed so rapidly upon one another during those years, and was in a better position to turn them to account. Moreover, Nathan was the most enterprising of the five sons, of which fact his decision to go to England was itself an indication. The commercial activities of the House of Rothschild in Frankfurt itself were not limited to one branch of business. It took any chance of earning a profit, whether as commission or forwarding agents, or in the trade of wine and textiles, which had recently been declared free, and in silk and muslin, not to mention coins and antiquities. The wine business in particular expanded greatly. And Mayor Emil did not fail to use every opportunity for extending his connections with princes and potentates even beyond the sphere of the Duke of Hesse. One of the most important connections established at Frankfurt was that with the princely house of Thurn and Taxes, the head of which, Prince Karl Anselm, held the important position of hereditary postmaster in the Holy Roman Empire. This family was of Milanese extraction. In Italy it was known as Della Tour, in France's DLA Tour. It had invented the idea of a post, and had introduced a postal system in the Tyrol, toward the end of the 15th century. In 1516 it was commissioned by the Emperor Maximilian I to inaugurate a mounted postal service between Vienna and Brussels. Even at that early date the dignified rank of Postmaster General was conferred upon one of its members. That was the starting point of the impressive development of the Thurn and Taxius postal system which came to embrace the whole of Central Europe. 
the head offices of the system were at Frankfurt, but the family were not satisfied with the normal development of their undertaking. They turned the information obtainable from the letters entrusted to their charge to profit. The end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries saw the development of the practice of opening letters.